All right, go to 2 Timothy chapter number 4, if you will. Uh, we continue our look verse by verse through 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter number 4, we left off in verse 8, and, 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 and let's read a couple of verses, and then we'll, we'll give the Lord thanks. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Paul writes, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Uh, we can stop there. Let's give God the thanks. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and, and life in him. We thank you for his shed blood on Calvary's cross, the only thing that is required by you in order to get everlasting life, Father. We thank you for the blood of, 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 of the Lord Jesus on Calvary that, that gives us uh, salvation for all our sins, full and free, not by our own works, as religion says, but by the work uh, of Jesus Christ on the cross and by his faith, his faithfulness, to sacrifice there for us. Thank you that salvation today comes by your grace through our faith in Christ Jesus and no works of our own. Father, we thank you for his glorious resurrection. He didn't stay dead. He didn't stay in the tomb, but he rose from the dead the third day. And that, that resurrection, uh, he was raised again for our justification to be declared righteous. So we know that through that powerful resurrection, we have his life. And Father, thank you for his spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit first given to us, and then the spirit of Christ is, is built up by the word of God's grace, by the sound doctrine of the Apostle Paul. That's why we study this each week, Father, so that we can build up the mind and the life of the Lord Jesus Christ in us. We ask that as we study your word today, that you give us great insight, wisdom, and understanding, and most importantly, a greater appreciation of your glorious son, the Lord Jesus. It's in his wonderful name we pray. Amen. All right, the last two weeks, we've looked at these topics. We looked at, uh, two weeks ago, we looked at the issue of the crown of righteousness. Look at verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. We went over what that is. If you weren't with us, Ryan will post it soon. Make sure you check it out. It's important because the Lord raised us up in member, as members of the body to reign with him. But not every member of the body of Christ will reign with him. It's based on fighting a good fight finishing your course, keeping the faith, like Paul says in verse 7. We went over how you do that. Now, we'll touch on some of that today as well. In verse 8, he says, that crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give us. Last week, we went over the righteous judge. The word Lord means righteous judge. So every time someone says, Lord, 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 or oh Lord, you know, they're saying, oh righteous judge. That means he's judging all of us. Every time you say the word Lord, you're bringing up the fact that he's a judge. And what judges do is they sentence you. They weigh out the evidence and they make a sentence. And the judgment seat of Christ for the body of Christ is where we're all going to go. When the rapture happens, the resurrection, the next event is the judgment seat of Christ. And we saw last time, each and every one of us, if you're hearing my voice now and you're saved, you're going to be at the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of yourself on how you did the work of faith Labor, love, patience, and hope. That very verse that brother quoted, uh, uh, put in his, in his message. But if you're lost and you're listening, because we have lost people listening, if you don't know for sure you, you are saved, there's a judgment coming for you as well. The same righteous judge that's going to judge his believers will judge unbelievers at the great white throne. Now, that great white throne is not for reward or loss of reward. If you're at the great white throne as a lost person, you're going to the lake of fire. It's just you know, how much you will suffer in that lake of fire. That's, that's more him sentencing you like a sentencing judge. If you go to court, you might get convicted one day and the judge brings you back a month or two later for your sentencing. That's what the great white throne is for lost people. You don't want to go there and if, you, if, you, if, if you're not sure you're saved, wait till the end of this message. I'm going sure, to give you the message to know for sure. But for those of us who are saved, look at verse number eight. Henceforth, there is laid up for me, that's Paul, the faithful apostle, a crown of righteousness. He's going to reign with Christ. The crown is for a ruler, which the Lord, and every time you see Lord, it means the righteous judge. I told him last week, we don't have a justice system. People talk about the justice system or the Department of Justice. I call it the Department of Injustice, the DOI, not the DOJ. We have a legal system, sure. But it's not just. It's unjust. We saw that. It's unrighteous. We saw that last week in 1 Corinthians 6. 
The only righteous judge is the Lord Jesus Christ because he can take. Remember where we ended? He can read what's in your heart. He's going to bring it out. Even the good things you do, he's going to look at your motivation for doing it. Are you doing it just to get praise of men, which a lot of people do when they do good works? So the righteous judge, he weighs out everything at the judgment seat. But notice what Paul says here in verse 8. So he's going to give the apostle Paul a, a crown of righteousness. But Paul is not the only one who's going to get this crown of righteousness. It's available to other people like you and me. So let's find out today how we're going to get it. Look at that. Look at that verse. It says. Verse eight, and not to me only. It's not exclusive to the apostle, but unto what's that next word? All, All them also that love his appearing. Now, if he says you're going to reign, if you love his appearing, my job today is to make clear what does it mean to love his appearing? All right. Now, this issue of the appearing, I'm going to put this on the board. You can see something, you see it to appear, to, to manifest and so forth, to manifest, okay? Just like a, a, my, my daughter, she, she thinks she's a magician sometimes. She likes to hide under, she'll throw a blanket in the air or something and then run away like a, a magician. She likes to disappear, okay? <laughs> All right, she thinks she's, a, she's, a, she's very melodramatic. That's why she's in plays and stuff. But the appearing, what is the appearing of our, what it means to love his appearing? What is his appearing? Now, while it is true that Paul uses this term appearing, watch this, in reference to the end of the dispensation of grace where we live, okay, what's commonly known as the rapture, where we're caught up in the air to meet the Lord, Paul calls it uh, 2 Timothy 2, the resurrection okay, of the body of Christ when we get our new bodies and so forth, our glorious bodies. It is true that Paul does use this word appearing in reference to the end of the dispensation of grace. But, but there's more to it we're going to find out today. In fact, go back to chapter 4, 2 Timothy 4, verse 1. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 1. Starts off the chapter. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick or that those who are alive and the dead, those who have already died. By the way, physical death, you don't escape God's judgment. Those same heathen atheists, we talk about at CERN who trying to find, you know, the beginning of the universe, the God part of it. They think that once they die, it's over and it's, you know, it's just over. Wrong. The Bible makes it clear in Revelation that all these people are going to have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. It's the second death. Revelation 21, 8. Physical death. Let me show you what death is in the Bible. Death means separation at its core. Separ separation. And whether it's the separation of your soul and your spirit from your body. James says in James 2, as the body without the spirit is dead, okay, your spirit, soul, and body. We normally say body, soul, spirit, but that's how man looks at it. 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul says that God looks at us, a tripart being, we're spirit, soul, and body. God cares for your spirit first. That's where he looks because he's a spirit. Then he cares for your soul. That's secondary. Your soul is who you are, your soul with the spirit and with the body. And then obviously your physical body, this little vile body here, is how you operate in this realm. We were talking about different realms, right? Well, because this body is for this realm here, the physical realm, to, to, to interact on earth naturally. But you are a soul and you have a spirit. Spirit gives life. And what physical death is, separation from your, of your spirit and soul from your body. But Revelation talks about a second death. Revelation 21, verse 8. So if this is the second, if this is the first death, what is the second death? Well, that's the separation of your soul from the presence of Almighty God forever. You're going to be in a lake of fire while he's ruling and reigning uh, forever. You're going to be uh, separated from Almighty God, okay? And 
the lake of fire. All liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. If you've ever told a lie, this is where you're going. The lake of fire, Revelation 21. Mm -hmm. Now, if you if you're saying you say, wait a minute, brother Ron, everybody has told a lie, at least one. I always tell people, how many lies do you have to take to be a liar? One. If you lie to your girl once, she, you're a liar. You know what I mean? Look here. It only takes one lie to be a liar because God is the truth. And if God says if you've ever told at least one lie, you're going to go to the lake of fire, that really condemns everybody. But there's a way out of that. Hold on. There's a way out of that. So the second death, so that's your separation of your soul. Sin separates you from God. You need a bridge to Almighty God. And we're going to talk about that, okay? Look at that verse again, chapter 4, verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge. Remember that issue of judgment. Everybody's going to be judged. Dying physically <laughs> won't get you out of the judgment. Even lost people say stuff like this when, some, when their loved one dies. He's in a better place. I know dad's looking down upon me. I hear the athletes say that when they win the Super Bowl, dad's looking down upon me. Dad might be looking up a point, I don't know. Okay, it depends on what, what he made a choice here. But you understand, lost people say, he's looking down, he went to a better place. I told you about, you know, that guy Ron Siles, oh, this guy was bold, he used to be an atheist, he got saved. His, his, his aunt died, his mother's sister, and he was in the limo with his family. And his mother, he's a grace believer. And, 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 and uh, his mother says, my sister's in a better place. He looked at his mom and said, how do you know that? You don't know for sure. And she's like, what are you talking about? Well, if she didn't trust the Lord Jesus Christ, she's not in a better place. They got mad at him. Yeah, they got mad at him. Because <laughs> they just, it's funny, they try to keep him alive all, or somebody escaped the death. They say, oh, that person was lucky. But had they died, oh, he's in a better place. Well, which one is it? Was it lucky or was he in a better, going to a better place? You know. That's what lost people got to do because they all over the place. They don't know anything. God is going to judge you if you're alive or even if you died. He will raise you up to, to the judgment. That's what revelation. Now, look what he says here. Verse one. I charge thee, therefore, before God. And the righteous judge, Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus, who shall judge the quick, those who are alive. And the dead, those people who died before he got there, he's just going to raise them up and judge them too. You commit suicide. You ain't escaping. You might escape this world. You ain't escaping God's judgment. He's going to just raise you up. At his appearing and his kingdom. And what we saw last time, that appearing had to do with him coming back at the rapture for the body of Christ and taking us to the judgment seat of Christ. That's where we're going. So he's going to judge there. That's the first judgment. But then later, he's going to come back to the earth, uh, to Israel in Jerusalem, and he's going to judge there too. That's his kingdom, his earthly kingdom. So he's going to judge here, and he's going to judge there later. And what I want you to see is that Paul does use that word appearing to talk about what's going to happen at the end of this dispensation of grace. So that's legit, but you have to get all of what Paul does. And Paul also uses the appearing to talk about when it began and all the way through it, okay? So from beginning all the way through to the end, when Christ came down from heaven, when the body of Christ goes up in this entire dispensation of grace, what Paul calls this, 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 the message for this day of grace is the appearing. Let me show you that, okay? It goes all the way through that. Now, let's, let's look at that. Go with me to chapter number one. Let me see if I want to start you there. It's chapter number one. Go to chapter number one. Second Timothy chapter number one. Take a little break, get some water. Start at verse number eight, 2 Timothy 1, verse 8. If Paul ends the book of 2 Timothy about the appearing, we need to see how he uses, if, if, if he does use that word again in the book, 
which he does, 2 Timothy 4.1, but he used it in the beginning of the book, 2 Timothy 1, verse, look at verse 8, if you will. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, that's the message, nor of me, his prisoner, that's the messenger. Okay? To God, the messenger and the message are, the, are, 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 are um, their package deal. You know how Islam, they say, there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. That's their, their, their creed. We believers should say there's, no, there's only one God, God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and, and one prophet for today, one apostle, Paul. We need to have that same zeal. Don't kill anybody over it, but we need to have that same zeal. Amen. Listen. Be not, verse 8, be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. That's, that's his message, the mystery. Nor of me, his prisoner, that's his messenger, the apostle Paul. Remember in Philippians 1, there were men preaching the message, but they hated the apostle Paul. And Paul says, you know what? They hate me. They're going to pay for that. But in the meantime, I'm just glad Christ is preached. I do rejoice. Watch what he says. Don't be ashamed of the message or the messenger. Verse eight. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. It's the gospel of grace according to the power of God. That's the grace of God. Now look at verse nine. Who hath saved us. That's the save the body. And we have a calling and called us with a what type of calling? A holy, a set apart unto God calling. We have a calling. Listen, when you get saved, God just doesn't say, yeah, okay, you saved now. All right, that's it. No, you're to be sanctified, set apart unto God. He wants you to continue to grow in that salvation. Not according to our works. That's not how he saved us, right? Today under grace, we're saved not by works. At no other time in history does man not have to work. Man had a religion. Israel had a religion. And they had to work, 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 work. When Paul was saved, God says, you don't have to work to be saved. You just trust my son. Where our good works come in is after salvation, right? For reward, but not for salvation. You got to rightly divide that. Let's keep going. Verse 9. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus. When you see him put Christ before Jesus, that's because he's suffering. God knew the cross would happen, so here's what he's going to do. Before the world began. God had this in mind before he created anything. He had this wonderful message that he didn't reveal until 4,000 years after Adam to the Apostle Paul. That's the mystery. That's what's called a mystery. All right, let's keep going. Verse 10. But is now made manifest. That's why I use that word manifest. By the what? Appearing... This is not a future appearing at the end, the rapture. This is something that has already happened. By the appearing of who? Our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death. Death had no more dominion over you. Now, we may die physically. Our soul and spirit might be separated from our body before the rapture. But death has no dominion over it. He's just going to resurrect us into his glorious kingdom. He hath abolished death and had brought life and immortality. Immortality, mortal means subject to death. Immortality means you'll never die again. What did he say in our John study on Wednesday? I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that believeth on me, sorry, but, um, like, yeah, though, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that believeth on me shall never die. In other words, if you trust him, you'll never die eternally. He's dealing, he's, he's dealing with both of those, actually. Though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that, uh, and he that believed in me uh, shall never die. He's talking about that one, okay? So either way, if you died before he got here, he'll raise you. If you're alive when he gets here, you'll never die. Beautiful, okay? Now watch this, verse 10. Abolish death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now, which gospel? Every time you hear the word gospel, what are you supposed to ask? Which, one? which gospel? That's right. Gospel, which one? 
Because there's multiple gospels in scripture. Wh which one? All the way back to Abraham. That's go all the way back. And, and if you want to be technical, you can take it back to Genesis 3.15, right? Mm -hmm. The proto evangelist the first one, it, 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 the, the, the seed of the woman. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it's which gospel? The gospel of the circumcision, the gospel of uncircumcision. The gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the grace of God. Okay, let's keep going. Galatians, Galatians chapter 2, verse 7 through 9 in the KJV. That's why you got to have the right Bible. All the other Bibles change it. It talks about the gospel of the uncircumcision committed to Paul and the gospel of the circumcision to Peter. This one to Paul, our apostle. Here's to Peter, Israel's apostle. Those are two different gospels in one verse. Unless you change it in our new Bibles. See, old Satan boy, he's a subtle look. Adversary and enemy. Well, let me show you this. Look at verse number 11. Which gospel? Verse 11. Whereunto I am appointed. That's Paul. A preacher. A warning and, and so forth. An apostle. A sent one. A teacher. Instructor. Of the who? Gentiles. Of the Gentiles. So the, the, the appearing has to do with what was given to the apostle Paul. Uh, go over to Acts chapter 26, if you will. Look at Acts chapter 26. The Lord Jesus Christ will say that very thing to the Apostle Paul. He said it in time when he actually came, but it's recorded. Watch this. Uh, Acts 26, verse six, uh, 16. Uh, let's start at verse 13. Uh, just to, This is the road to Damascus. People ask me all the time, they say, Hey, Brother Ron, how do I share right division with someone? And I give him the same answer. Start with the salvation of Paul. That's where he did. Start. You know what? People talk about the Romans road. When you grow up in evangelical Christ Christendom, they talk about the Romans road. Actually, that's the wrong road to be on, quite frankly, in the con because of the context of it. Okay. I would say you start with the road to Damascus because that's what Paul does. By the way, the Romans road actually deals with the Jew, quite frankly, but that's a whole other stuff. Here, but road to Damascus. You start with Paul, and you start with Saul. That's what his Jewish, his, his Hebrew name, Paul. You start with Paul's salvation, and that's in Acts 9. Acts 9, and you say, why is Paul in the Bible? And if you don't know, we got a whole booklet called, Why Paul? Mm -hmm. We have spat, we... You speak Spanish, we got we got our track in Spanish. Mm -hmm. We got why Paul, we got right division track. See, but this one, why Paul, it explains what God's doing today. Why is Paul in the Bible? He already had 12 apostles, speaking of the Lord. For Israel, he already had put them on 12 thrones, judging 12 tribes of Israel. Why does he need a 13th apostle? Some people say, oh, he's the 13th apostle. There's only 12 tribes. That's not it. Well, Peter and them didn't do what God said. Oh, yes, they did. They were, they were controlled. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. They spoke God's word from the Holy Spirit in Acts. The only reason Paul was saved because God brought in something new and different. And it was a mystery. From the beginning. Yes, it was even before the world began. That's right, though. It was a mystery from before the, from the, in the beginning. That's right. Now, look at Acts 26. Verse 13, road to Damascus. At midday, O king, I saw in the way, that's on the way to Damascus, a light from where? Heaven. Now, he didn't just say it was bright as the sun. We were talking about this, right, Matthew? We were talking about how when you look at the Mount of Transfiguration, when the Lord transfigured before Peter, James, and John, he was as bright as the sun, right? Which is very bright. You look at the sun, you get blinded. Here's a light that's greater than the noon, the midday, noonday sun. Notice, above the brightness of, a sun, of the sun. Do you understand when the Lord is in his glory, the sun pales in comparison to his glory? Did you think that would blind a man? Yeah. Paul was blinded for three days and three nights. In fact, he had eye problems the rest of his life because his physical body couldn't take the what he saw, he, he was a, the effects of it lasted his whole life. He had very bad eyes. He looked at that high priest, didn't know it was him, and gave his eye, oh, I didn't know. He told the Galatians, you guys would have given me your eyes. That's how appreciative he could. They didn't have the technology, but if they did, 
these people were willing to donate their eyeballs. You can do that today, quite frankly. Donate their eyeballs to the apostle. That's how much they used to appreciate them. Then they didn't like them no more. Because they let other men come and lie to them. Anyway, verse number 14. And when we were all fallen to the earth, him and his guys with him, all these Jews, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the what? Hebrew, Hebrew tongue. Interesting. This is written in Koine Greek. People talk about the Greek and the Hebrew in there. Okay. The guy coming today, he, he's one of those people. It's going to be an interesting conversation. Because although this was written in Koine Greek, the language of that day, God spoke, Christ spoke to Paul in Hebrew. So our Lord spoke Hebrew to Paul, to Saul. He heard it in Hebrew, mm -hmm. and yet it's recorded in Greek, and it's still God's word in English too. Who, who originally confused the languages of the world? God. God, Genesis 11. And in Acts 2, the Spirit of God came, and they were able to speak all. Language barriers don't stop God. We made this Spanish. We made a track to a salvation track in English. And one of our brothers, Fernando and the bear, he said, you know what? I'm going to put it in Spanish because we got a lot of Spanish. I said, do it. So he took our English and put it in Spanish. And guess what? I can't read Spanish, but I'm assuming it's saying just what we wrote. <laughs> Fernando said it does. You know, you can check it out if you speak Spanish. <laughs> and give it to somebody who speaks For real. Because the language doesn't stop God. He's the God of languages. If you can't read Greek, you can't read Greek either. And even if you did, you can't do it like the guys who tra translate the King James Bible, Hebrew and Aramaic. That's just a ploy to get you off of the truth. Language doesn't stop God. Notice here he says, he spoke to me in the Hebrew tongue, although it was recorded in Greek. He says in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, verse 14, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? The Lord says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And when, by the way, when he says it to double like that, verily, verily, Saul, Saul, it's a type of Israel. He's, he's speaking in his first coming and in his second coming. Because he's going to they, they're going to persecute him through his people in his first coming. They did. And even after the rapture, when he has another little flock, they're going to persecute them. Saul, Saul. Abraham, Abraham, Jacob, Jacob, barely very. If God says something once, it's true. Why, why does he double up like that? Because he's showing the first coming of Christ. And it's a picture of the first coming of Christ and the second coming. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Saul was a Bible student of the Old Testament. And when, when he heard about Jesus as the Messiah, when he saw him, somebody said he could have been the rich young ruler there in the parable because it doesn't name him. And he did all these things. He says, Philippians 3 says, the, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, I was blameless. Because the rich young ruler says, I've done all those things from my youth up. Paul, Saul was under, under Gamaliel from a boy. Mm -hmm. He kind of fits that. Interesting. Mm -hmm. He says, I had known Christ after the flesh. He had some, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. So all these Pharisees, you don't think Saul would have been there in Jerusalem? Mm -hmm. This is interesting. Now, he was hearing things that was starting to convict him. That's what the pricks are. God's word is a sword. It just pricks your heart. And he, he was fighting. He says, no, I don't want it to be Jesus. I don't want it to be Jesus. I don't want it to be Jesus. Mm -hmm. People do that today. They can see, well, the Lord's, he's, he's drawn me through the word. You know, we were just talking about this today. Mm -hmm. It's a process, a journey. And, you say, and if you fight, you fight. Eventually, he's pricking you, and you want a soft heart. But sometimes, like the ones in... Acts 7, they ignored the pricks. But if you poke something soft, it starts to build a callus, right? And then he has to cut you like with the sword of the Spirit. So don't fight the pricks. Notice, verse 15, and I said, who art thou, Lord? And in the and I know he was saying this, don't let it be Jesus. Don't let it be Jesus. You know what Jesus means? His name, it's in his name. Savior. Yeah, Jehovah saves. Jehovah saves or Jehovah is the Savior. All these things are the Savior or Jehovah is salvation. I mean, his name is that. <clears throat> He's saying, please don't let it be Jehovah is salvation. Jehovah is salvation. Mm -hmm. He goes, wait a minute. Jehovah is salvation. Yes, Jesus. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the Jews had to call upon his name. They, it, it, they had to say, Jesus is Lord. Watch this. Amen. 
And I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, it was the, it was the worst thing that Paul could ever hear, but also the best. I am who? Jesus, whom thou persecuted. <coughs> Acts 9, you know what Paul said? It's not recorded here. He says, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? He accepted him as Lord. He's, by the way, he's a worker boy. He gets saved. He says, now, what you want me to do, Lord? Let's go. Let's go. I wish more people were like, you get saved. Like, all right, Lord, what's much as lie in me, what you got for me, baby? And if all you know is how to get saved, go share that with people. You don't know nothing. Brother Mark was going to bring this guy, Jason. He was trying to explain stuff to this guy. He goes, Ron, I couldn't answer this guy. Of course, I know you're not ready, Mark. Bring him here. Share salvation, but that's what we other brothers who are, and sisters are here for. We are here to, to, to strengthen you and to help them. Notice here, verse number 16, but rise and stand upon thy feet. There's a lot there in that, but I'm going to get to it now. For I have, what's that next word? Appeared. His appearing. I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. What's the purpose? To make thee, you Paul, a minister and a witness. Both of these things which thou hast seen, the road to Damascus, and of those things in the which I will what? Appear. I will appear unto you. Paul had visions and revelations of the Lord. And what I, what I said earlier, this disappearing that we're to love has to do with the message given to Paul on, from the road to Damascus in Acts 9 all the way through to the rapture. Mm -hmm. And what Paul calls that message is the mystery of Christ. Or, or somebody say, you got it right. Preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. <clears throat> if you love that message, if you love it, if you, what's love? Remember our study on love? Mm -hmm. It's action. Love suffers long and is kind of toward others. But love is always action. It's the acknowledging of the truth. It's not just saying like Charles Stanley said. No, I, brother down in Georgia. I see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see it. I see what I know Paul is unique. I know his message is different. But if I teach this, I'm going to lose stuff now. I'm going to get kicked out of the Baptist convention. I'm going to lose most of my, my members. i got thousands of members. Millions of people on TV, radio. He wasn't willing to count that cost. He didn't understand the judgment seat of Christ lost. Because it's not taught. It's not preached. Mm -hmm. As it should. Listen, you're going to lose something anyway. You might as well lose it now and count those things but lost Philippians 3 for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. You need to go after that prize. You're gonna, by the way, if you preach this, forget preaching. If you believe this, if you act on it, you're going to lose friends and family. Mm -hmm. Everybody I know who act upon this, who love it, they lose friends and family. Mm -hmm. So will you. That's a good test, by the way, if you love it. When you start losing friends and family over, mm -hmm. it's going to happen. Brother Ron, I'm going to take this to my old church and talk to my old pastor. No, you ain't. Mm -hmm. Well, you can. You're going to get kicked out. Right. Get out. Bye-bye. I'm going to share this with my husband. No, oh, don't you. By the way, don't, women don't do this anyway. That's not the dynamic. That will never work. <laughs> it won't work. God didn't make a man to receive spiritually from a woman. Somebody did that in the Bible named Adam. And that's why we die today and hurt today. Okay, don't do it. But there's men. God put that into, into men. Women, women, listen, women can be a vessel. They can be, a, um, they can be used as, which many of you all are as a conduit for, for information, but the actual teaching to another soul is put into the, the man's responsibility, okay? But if you start sharing, look, if you, if one of you ladies said, oh, I speak Spanish, I'm gonna get this to my, my mom. Check this out, mom, mom, dad. Let me read it to you. Oh, I can't believe it, I'm a Catholic. I can't believe this stuff. And they're gonna alienate you, it's gonna happen. It's going to get cold, the relationship. Krista has dreams about her family rejecting this. Mm -hmm. she, she said, I woke up and my dad was asking me why we believe it. I said, he might get to that point really. He's very gracious. His name is John. John was gracious. But uh, they don't believe it. They probably wonder why we believe it. They just don't say it because they, they're nice. You're going to lose friends, friends. Look, let's look at it. Rise upon thy feet. 
verse 16. Uh, Rise, stand upon thy feet. Uh, at the end of that, and those things which in where I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people, as people of Israel, and from the Gentiles, the nations, unto whom now I send thee. Now what is Paul's ministry? This is the verse. To open their eyes. Now you know he's not talking about your physical eyes. Yeah, your spiritual eyes. The eyes of your enlightenment. Your eyes of understanding. And to turn them from darkness, Satan's kingdom, to light, Christ's kingdom. Well, he got it right there. And from the power of who? Satan. Satan. When you're lost, you're under Satan's power. And you want to be under God's power. It comes through the Lord Jesus and Paul's preaching of him. That they may receive not just remission of sins like the Jews. Because what's remission? If cancer goes into remission, there's a possibility it can come back on you. Mm-hmm. When you trust Christ the way Paul preaches... You get forgiveness of sins. God forgives you all your sins. Mm-hmm. You, nothing you do from past, present, or future, because it's, it's a gift, will keep you out of heaven. Mm-hmm. Study after study. Where your sins become an issue after salvation do not affect your salvation. It affects your reward, but not your salvation. You're saved forever. That's God's grace. Ooh. Amen. That they may receive forgiveness of sins. Okay, that's our justification, our position. But he saved us for more than that. Look at the rest of this verse. And inheritance mm-hmm. among them. This is going to be the joint heirs. Which are sanctified, set apart unto God. By faith that is in me. See, that forgiveness of sins, that makes you an heir of God. Ephesians. You receive Everlasting life, citizenship in heaven, and, 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 and a glorious body for the heavens. You, you're not going to be in these vile bodies anymore. You're going to hurt no more. You're going you're gonna to be hurting and, 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 and subject to death. He's going to give us a glorious body like of his. But these people who are inherited, this is the reward of the inheritance, that reigning with Christ, Colossians 3. And you know what Paul says, end in verse 19. Whereupon King, o- uh, uh, excuse me, whereupon old King Agrippa, do you see his passion? As Paul is saying this, he's saying it with a passion. He's not sitting there, well, you know, King Agrippa, this happened. He's like, old King Agrippa. Mm-hmm. He's preaching this to this man. He's talking to a king, the very thing he was supposed to do in Acts 9. Uh, Verse number 19, whereupon old King Agrippa, you see his passion there. I was not disobedient unto this earthly vision. Heavenly vision. Heavenly vision. Mm -hmm. See, people think when they're in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and John, his earthly ministry, right? They think that when he went up to heaven, when he, when he ascended to heaven, that that was it, that he was done talking, right? That's why most of the Christians don't stay over here. They might get into Acts a little bit, up until about Acts 2, right? Mm-hmm. Then they pretend nothing else exists after the whole pouring out of the Holy Ghost. In our John study, not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday, we're going to look at that issue when he breathed on them about the Holy Ghost. But now, in Acts 9, seven chapters later, seven is the number of spiritual perfection, Acts 9, Jesus Christ came down and he spoke again. He wasn't done speaking when he went up into heaven. Mm -hmm. He came out of heaven's glory, saved Saul of Tarsus, made him the apostle Paul for us, and he spoke again the mystery of Christ. That's how you understand your Bible. Go back to Acts 2. The olive tree. He cut it down. That's right. Romans 11. Mm -hmm. One day he's going to raise that sucker up again, but that's that's, that's Mm -hmm. that's not now. Go to Acts chapter 9. Thank you, Matthew. That's right. The olive tree represents Israel's access to God. Speaking of, beautiful thing, he used the olive. Sunshine in a bottle. That come. That's the best olive oil you've ever had. <laughs> Ryan's family olive oil. We use it ourselves. Sunshine in a bottle. Olive. Olive oil. Right here from Modesto, California, baby. I gotta give him a plug. He's working hard. <laughs> hey! Romans 16, 1 and 2. I commend unto you, Phoebe, our sister. She's a, uh, she, she is a servant of the church, which is in St. Korea. She, and, and she's been a, 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 a 
a secure or a helper of, of the churches, and myself also, Paul says, that you assist her in whatsoever business she has as becoming saints. We're to help one another. Okay? That's why I did that. Let me show you something in Acts 9, verse number 15. Acts 9, 15. But the Lord said unto him, to Ananias, Go thy way, for he, that Saul, is what type of vessel? A chosen vessel unto me. Who chose Saul Paul? Christ did. God the Father did and then sent his son. The Godhead chose him. He's a chosen vessel of God unto me, the Lord, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings. That's why he was speaking to King Agrippa and the children of Israel. That's the entire world. In fact, God changed it up. He put the Gentiles first now and put Israel aside. Interesting. Oh, in the back of the bus. Verse 16. For I will show him how great things he must what? Suffer. That's what, when you suffer with and for the Lord Jesus Christ in the mystery, that's what he says I was apprehended to do, Philippians 3, to reign with Christ, but you got to suffer with him in the message. Mm -hmm. And the way he suffers in that message is rejection. People are going to reject you. Why don't we have, why aren't you? Charles Stanley's church, thousands of people, millions of people on, on, on TV. Money. Money. <laughs> Filthy lucre. It's a lucrative business. He wasn't willing to suffer the loss now. He wanted the ease of life now. Sad. So sad. And so when he gets to the judgment seat of Christ, what, what's forever, it is sad. It's a wasted life, Dodie. I don't care if you're in ministry 70 years here in this world. You, you're going to miss out on reigning with Christ there. Well, look at verse 17. And Ananias went his way. The Lord told him to go, he went. And entered into the house where Paul was sitting. And putting his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul. First time any of these guys called him a brother. The Lord, even Jesus, that appeared, that what? Appeared unto thee in the way, as thou camest to Damascus there, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. My point is, the appearing, it began with the road to Damascus, is going through what he will appear in the Paul, the vision of Revelation, and it will end with the appearing of the Lord. So when Paul says, go back to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. So how do you know when you're going to reign with him and get that crown of righteousness? Do you love this message given to Paul? Amen. Now, you can't love something you don't know. You ever wonder why when the Bible talks about a husband and wife, being intimate, it says, and he knew his wife. Mm -hmm. He knew his wife. If you don't know Paul's message, today is the day to start. Because that's what's going to qualify you to reign. Who wants people around them that doesn't love them? I mean, what makes a family a family is love. We're poor as dirt, and our daughter got a cushy nerf life. We tell her that all the time when she cry about something. She's on stage acting. She get she got both her grandparents on her my side. Both her parents they send they flood her with gifts and stuff and love and money and stuff. She's homeschooled. She just wake up when she wants. You ready for school? Yeah. I'm tired. Take a nap. Yeah, I'm hungry, Mama. We tell her we sit in school. We got another period. We hungry. We sitting there doing work. Our stomach's growling. We we remind our daughter how good she got it. We ain't got no money, but we give her love. Love. I tell her. I say you got a cushy nerf life, girl. She she looks at the clock. Gone. Is other are other children in school right now? I go yeah. Okay. <laughs> I said, you're just doing two hours of school. They, they're away from their parents for 10 hours. You got mom, and now dad, too. I'm like, so we got a reminder. Because she's seven and selfish like any seven-year-old. And we say, you got a cushy little nerf life. But that becomes, a, that comes from the decisions years ago in the making of your parents becoming grace believers and going into the marriage life. It, see, it's about the truth of God's word. And we show her that she's loved. And what makes it a family's love. 
Because you can't have a family without love. It won't work. Look at this. When Paul says, look at that verse, <clears throat> loving his appearing. God wants you to love this message of the Apostle Paul. Now, I can't answer that for you. Only you can say, I love this message. And Dodie, you mentioned it earlier when we started. We have about seven minutes. Love requires action. Acknowledging of the truth, it's more than just having a knowledge of it. It's acting upon the knowledge. You know how I know that you guys, at least I got a hint that you guys love this message. Y'all here right now today. Amen. Even more so the people follow. And a lot of them do. It was, it could be somebody. I know that you are able to get out of your bed. You got children, come from Stockton. All this stuff, you, you guys show it in action. But see, Paul says you want to continue that, finish that course, finish it. Because mm -hmm. we're going to see a guy named Demas. <laughs> I'm going to look at him next week. We're going to read about him, but next week we're going to look at Brother Demas. Because he started off well, doing and saying all the stuff. He was on fire for Jesus. <laughs> Until that woman come along. <laughs> <laughs> With a guy that's almost always a woman, don't he? I'm sorry. Gosh. Adam, Job, Samson, Satan, no. It's, it's good for us. Not the bad one, it's the guy. That it, it's coming down the pipe, man. That's going it's always that just derails me. Somebody said, anyway. That's probably what it was, Dodie. Paul's being kind when he just says he loved this present world. But you know what it was. <laughs> it was his flesh, man. All right, let's go. So you want to love his appearing. Verse number, no, verse number nine. We're going to just finish uh, nine and ten. And then I'll pick up on ten uh, next week. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. Now Paul's in a Roman prison. And later in the chapter, if you're with us, you're going to see why he said to do this. There's some needs that Paul has and Timothy can fill them, Okay. Timothy's at Ephesus. If you, if you can do this another time, but look at your Bible map. They got the, they're going to call it the missionary journeys of the apostle, but they're more than missionary. They're apostolic journeys. And, and if you see where Rome is, way over in Italy, and Ephesus is over here, Asia Minor, Turkey today, that's a nice little distance. Mm -hmm. So Timothy's going to leave there and go and minister to Paul. He's going to take some stuff, okay? And by the way, it's coming up on wintertime. That's another reason. I'll talk about that later. Verse 9. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas hath what? Forsaken me. Forsaken is he abandoned him and is a time of need. You know, the Bible says a brother is born for adversity. God, the, the picture of a brother in the Bible is you're, you stand here and your brother, when, he, when you hear he got my back, it's y'all standing back to back like roped off and fighting, man. Like like uh, Batman and Robin in the old 60s. They, they, they grab arms and they kick and stuff. A brother is born for adversity. And when your brother abandons you, he leaves you out to dry. That's the worst feeling. You feel like you were betrayed. That's what happened. Happened to the Lord with Judas too. But that's what happened with the Apostle Paul with Demas. Look at verse number 10. For Demas hath forsaken. He didn't just say he left me. He had some business over there. He forsook him. He, he abandoned him in his time of need. Mm -hmm. We're going to look at that. And having, having loved this present world, and Dodie used to say, it was a woman. must have been a woman. <laughs> we'll talk about that next week. And as departing to Thessalonica, we'll see why. I'll show you why I believe he went to Thessalonica next week. Now, he didn't say Cretans and Titus forsaken. He didn't use that word. Cretans... He's just saying, Timothy, I need you because one guy, he abandoned me. These other two guys had business in Galatia, Cretans to Galatia. We'll talk about that. And Titus, you know, he's faithful. He went to Dalmatian. And what Paul would have done, he would have sent them to do some work. We'll see that next week. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Uh, uh, verse 12, and Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus. Let's end here because, so what happened is, Tychicus is with Paul in Rome. Paul writes the letter, has, he rolls it up and says, now take this to Timothy. So Tychicus leaves Rome, he goes to Ephesus. They had, and, they had to go by ship. And they went by ship. Yeah, exactly, you're right. right. Look at the so he goes, and then he gets there, he hands, he gives Timothy the letter. 
Then he says, Timothy, I'll stay, hold down the fort here. Paul needs to see you before he dies. Timothy could have went back, but what Paul is doing is he wants to see his son before he dies. Like in the Bible, when one of those old patriarchs was dying, you see Jacob and Esau who battled for years, who hated, his, Esau hated Jacob for what his Jacob brother did, what he, what he perceived he did, still, 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 uh, still in the birthright. But when their father was dead, he, dying, he, he put aside that, and then what he wanted to do is, they want, it's like the family, dad's on his deathbed, even when families battle, they all come and see daddy. Well, what Paul wanted was the last, he wanted his eyes to see Timothy one more time. And that's why he says, I sent Tychicus to Ephesus, take the letter, but also stay there in your stead. You come and bring some stuff, but I want to see you before I die. I want to lay eyes on you. I've been thinking about you. I've been, I've been mindful of your tears. They didn't have, oh, I got to end. Technology is fantastic. Mm -hmm. The Apostle Paul would not even fathom the technology. He would say that the internet is good and bad, a blessing and a curse. People from all around the world can hear the grace message. They ain't got a grace church. They can... But you can have all type of other creeps coming in, right? They're creeping in. Mm -hmm. The Apostle Paul, if he lived today, he could just say, I want to FaceTime you, Timothy. Oh, no. Uh, what they, what they call that one? No, what's the, what's the little iPhone thing? That's all. Oh, that's what that is? You could just see somebody. They couldn't do that there. So Timothy had to make this treacherous journey just to see Paul. Paul used to pull out his... Do they have cell phones in prison? I know they're exposed to them. <laughs> Smuggling. Love, much love. See you. see you on the other side, baby. All right. You couldn't do that in Paul's day. You could, technology is wonderful. I bet Paul, he did... We got to end. But you know who saw technology but couldn't fathom it? John. Yes. He saw the future technology. And he's trying to describe it in Revelation. He's just got to use words in the first century. But he saw things that blew his mind. That things we'll see, we'll go, oh, yeah, that's that. Yeah, that's that. Because we live in that time. Anyway, it's, it's amazing. But they couldn't FaceTime back there, so he had to actually go see him. We're going to pick up next week. We're going to look at Demas and the rest of these guys. If you're listening, though, remember earlier we talked about the lake of fire. And if you ever told a lie... Because God is truth. He can't have you in his presence. He must separate you. And there's the, the only place you can go and separate yourself forever is the lake of fire. Because God can't have you. He, he cannot lie. He's the truth. But he's offered a way to fix that. If you don't want to go to the lake of fire, somebody took it for you. The Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And what he did is on that cross, he took that second death. God made his soul an offering for sin. So as Jesus was my God, my God, why is that forsaken me? God the Spirit and God the Holy, God the Father separated themselves from him. And as he suffered, he did that for you so that you can tell a lie and not go to the lake of fire. Now, God don't want you lying, but if you ever did any sin, Jesus took it upon himself. The man Christ Jesus, he suffered for it. That's the gospel of grace. God doesn't want you to go to the lake of fire. That's why he sent his son to die for you. Why don't you trust him? It's no works today. We live in a time where no works are needed in order to be saved. That wasn't true before Paul. It won't be true after the appearing of our Lord at the end. But we live in a special time where you can be saved by grace. Now, if you are saved, if you just got saved today, or if you've been saved 20, 30, 40, 50 years, now it's all about good works in order to reign with Christ. And those good works have to be based upon Paul's gospel of grace. The rightly divided word. Now that's my job and the job of this assembly. And we hear from people all around the world, and I thank God for that because technology is a blessing, but it's a curse also. This guy said you have to be discerning, you do. We can help you with that though, but you got to be willing. You both save thyself and them that hear thee, he says to Timothy. All right, we'll help you with that. Pray for us and be a part of what God's doing through our ministry. Because very few people stand up for this truth in these last days. Very few. Amen. We want to be that faithful. Remnant. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy word. Your holy word made flesh in, in, the, in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Your holy scriptures, the written word of God that we study today, Father. And we have the privilege and honor of reading 
and studying each and every day. We we know people. Uh, and, and we I hope we don't take this for granted. We we're trying to send some King James Bibles to Africa right now because there's a shortage. We 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 take for granted. Heathens out in America have Bibles, King James Bibles sitting uh, right in their homes and with dust on. And people are starving for this Bible in other countries. May we never take uh, your holy word, the holy scriptures for granted in that way, as, as people in our culture do. May we have that thirst and appreciation as others, like our brethren there in Africa and other places. Father, we, we ask that your word today takes root in our hearts. There's someone here tonight or today and or listening who hasn't trusted your son, doesn't know for sure they had the salvation. May they, may they have that assurity right now that if they believe what your word says, that Jesus, your son, died for them. He shed his innocent blood for their sins. He took that second death so that they wouldn't have to go into the lake of fire. May they believe that, and you'll save them right now. And if they are saved, Father, may they continue on in the rightly divided word. May they love his appearing, that, that, that message given through the apostle Paul, so that they might receive that crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give us at that day of judgment seat. We thank you for our part that we can play in ministering to others, Father, both lost and saved. And we, uh, we ask you to bless our time together in the Q&A as well. We thank you for this in Christ's name.